I'm here with my caffeinated co-host, Matt Sheehan. Howdy. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm doing okay. I'm swell. We're here uh, against all odds. We are we are standing, baby. So, uh, Justin, great to see you, man. Yeah. How on earth are you doing, Justin? Doing no one well. ever asked this. Doing well. Yeah. Ask me this every week, and then you yeah. say you never ask me. So. Yeah, it's been one whole week, though, and I've missed you, Justin. <laughs> I've, I've missed that sleeveless Saturday on a Wednesday, by it's the way, over there. That's what I'm game talking two. about. Game two today. There we Sixers go. taking down the Celtics in Boston once again, hopefully. That's what I'm talking about. Max Christie and the Lakers. That's right. Players play. Tough players oh, win. Okay. Getting that dub uh, yeah. against the Warriors. Another Spartan dog who also plays very tough right uh, over in golden state yeah two fun uh, series there it's great spartan's gonna come out of that one so it's very exciting yeah very right. exciting um yeah a lot happening this week we'll we'll talk all about that throughout the episode one of the things uh, one of the things we've provided coverage on this week um i wrote an article today kind of diving into the offensive line room and kind of the growth that the unit has taken over um in, in the last few years since michigan state o-line coach chris kapilovic has been at the school and um, you can go and kind of find that on my Twitter profile. But the gist of my uh, sort of deep dive there was every single year, Michigan State has continued to accumulate talent. They've continued to develop talent and retain talent, all three of those concepts being key. Um, as a result of that, this year, the Spartans should have more depth than they've had at the O-line pretty much in the entire time that um, at least I follow them and in, in the last few years as well. So yep. um, starters should be improved as well a little bit just because of the depth they finally have rotating guys, keeping them fresh, but the depth is the biggest improvement. So um, kind of that's what I was looking into with the O-line and, and diving deep into that. But I think you'd agree, Matt, O-line recruiting and O-line development, good spot. I, I would say a really great spot. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. I mean, whether it's this class that just came in for this year, the next class they're already building yeah. in 2024. Yeah, I mean, you got to love where the O-line stands right now. And they're going to have a big season coming up. Yep. But, I mean, hey, you know, luckily it's not just wishful thinking. I mean, I think yeah. all the uh, ingredients are there for a good season from this offensive line, whether it be the talent of the starters or, just like you said, that depth, man. We, we've learned how important depth, especially in the trenches, is the yeah. last few years. And uh, this year is going to be no different yeah. for good reason. So Yeah, but good instead things. of our analysis why don't we bring in the coach that actually landed these players develops them and coaches them the juice man himself yeah let's go and joining us today <laughs> is coach cap chris kapilovic from the michigan state program as the offensive line coach how you doing today coach i'm great how are you guys doing good sensational now. yeah, yeah. We, we appreciate you making time we know you're on the road recruiting this whole month so uh hopefully you get a chance for yourself and to rest a little bit and giving some of that time to us is much appreciated uh, rest is overrated. We can get that. We get that in July in the dead period. <laughs> that's the spirit. See, that's why I love this guy. That's what I'm talking about. You can sleep all you want when you're dead, says Coach Cap. There we go. That's, right. that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Coach, you're in a good mood right now. Um, is part of this good mood because in the spring, all right, you didn't have to take walk on defensive linemen, play that um, uh, that offensive line, and you instead actually had just a, an embarrassment of riches of offensive linemen this spring. Does that just just make a man like you so much happier? I can't even put into words the difference that made. That was, I don't know if I've ever experienced that in my whole time as a coach, um, and, and it was challenging. And more so, you, you felt bad just for the team because you felt like going through a spring like that with just those, you know, a few guys that were practicing, you just couldn't get enough reps for the defensive guys. And you feel like you even slowed down the development of some of the skilled guys on offense because of what we were limited to do. So sure. uh, this spring was just, you know, a huge difference for us up front, but as a whole offense, you know, we had an opportunity to really grow and I felt really good about what we accomplished this spring. Yeah, it's great to hear. So, um, Coach, I, I know you heard the, the intro there where I was talking about how I think the depth has come light years away uh, from where it was when you first took over. Starters improving as well. Um, you kind of agree with that assessment? What, what's kind of your thought on the state of the O-line room now compared to, I guess, a year or two ago, two years ago? Just what are your thoughts on it? Well, you, you know, our first year here in 20, uh, there wasn't a lot of depth. And then, you know, Matt went down the first game, and so – we had some guys that, you know, chose to sit the season out and all that. Then you go to 21, and then I've had I had more depth than I've ever had going into that season where I was able to rotate nine guys, and, and that rarely happens. And so that, you know, that created some competition, but it also uh, we, we were able to play at a high level. And then the next year we took a big step back with uh, depth and, and even experience because of the amount of guys that we lost from that previous year. So – you know, I feel like now we're getting back to where we kind of want to be. And, and really, that's 
you know, if you look at teams that are successful consistently at a high level, you know, it's it's their roster, it's the depth they have. It's, you know, when you lose one guy, the next guy can step up. And, and that's where recruiting is critical. You know, it's it's lifeblood for everything you do. And and, and I've been really pleased with the, the three newcomers we had this spring. They, they jumped in and were far ahead where you would anticipate those guys being. So I, I'm excited about what we can get accomplished this summer. And I think we should, we should be a, a good group. And we're going to get to the newcomers here in a hot second, but I just want to talk about two guys that have been with this program since seemingly 2011, and that's J.D. <laughs> Duplain and Nick Samak. They could have, you know, made their decisions to go elsewhere after the season, whether it be give their hand at the NFL, just go on to the next thing in life or what have you, but they're back. I was thrilled when that happened, by the way, but, like, just for you, the offensive line coach, what's the biggest thing that they add to the room? Is it just their sheer talent? Is it the leadership, or what, what's the best thing out of those two guys? Well, all the above. I, I was right with you. I was excited to, to have them back. And we, we, the three of us really, you know, we, we looked at every angle and made sure what was best for them. And, and they, them to, to a man and with their families felt like it was best for them to come back and have another year of development and really just try to improve their, their game to where they get a chance to go to the next level. And, you know, you, you can't replace experience. Uh, the yeah. amount of games they played, uh, the competition they played against, you know, and, and you got that veteran center in there that's, that's, you know, when you get in some hostile environments, it's not going to be too much for him. JD's done a tremendous job as well, just providing leadership for our younger guys. So just the experience and leadership, and, and then they're, they're two damn good football players too. So, you know, all of that, all of that encompasses a, a really a lot of success for us to be able to keep them and, and stay with us and, and, and really not only what they're going to do this year, but what they're going to do with these young guys the culture that's created in our room that's that that you, that's hard to put into words you know when you got some older guys that got their degrees and and they they stay with the program and then they understand that you know coming back another year gives them an opportunity to to be the best player they can be and give them the best chance to to have a future in football you know the other guys can see that and and hopefully that grows as those young guys grow Coach, one of the things that is a theme that has stuck out to me so far in your tenure is not, over, not only have you landed a lot of guys, but you have retained a lot of guys. And the 2020 recruiting class for colleges all across the country, let alone a school where you guys just got here and didn't have previous relationships, the 2020 class is all, over, all around college football. There was a lot of attrition soon after that. How have you managed to, I think, almost not lose anybody that you have recruited um, since you've gotten here? Um, what does that say, I guess, about the recruiting process and your approach to that? How, how have you managed to do that? Well, it, stability in the offensive line room is critical. It's, it's you know, it, it's a unique position. It, it, it's a development position. Uh, it's the hardest position to recruit, you know, because you're looking at these guys when they're sophomores. And, and sometimes freshmen and even juniors, and you're trying to project, you know, how big will they be? Will they still be able to move when they put that weight on? And, and the one thing about, you know, in the old line world is it's a tough world. You know, practices really are fun. It's tough work. It's a thankless job at times, but it's also the most important job. And, and you don't know how these guys are going to handle that adversity they're going to get when they show up because they've been the best of the best everywhere they played up to that point. And then when they show up to college, they're, they're going to get humbled. And so how do they handle that? That's the hardest thing to measure. And I think the biggest thing with retaining these guys is, is creating, you know, we use the word culture all the time, but really having that room where, you know, they come in and, and I, I assign mentors to them with the older guys. They're surrounded by a lot of great people in our building. And, you know, I think the other thing is communication. You know, it's, it's constant communication for me. They always know exactly where they stand, what they need to do. What, what, what do they need to do to get where they want to go? And, and I think that when people understand, they know exactly where to stand in, in the depth chart, what they got to do to get to the next point, and know they're given a chance to show what they can do, then there's nothing for them to be upset about. And so I just think that, you know, older guys, like I said, a Nick and a JD, they're the culture setters right now. And, and, and I think, you know, these guys like being a part of Michigan State football. You know, I think the – you know, Coach Tuck, what he does, and Coach Johnson, and, and, and hopefully what I do with them is something that they, they feel like, hey, the grass isn't greener somewhere else, and this is a place I can get developed and play at the highest level, and, and we're here to win a championship. 
And so for the younger guys, who surprised you the most this spring? It could be just a guy that's a returner from last year's team or maybe just a new coming face. But was there anyone that you were like, I don't know you had that in you so far this spring. I mean, who who, <laughs> who shocked you, Coach? That I can give you a lot of names. I will say this first. Sweet. With the guys that have been on our roster, uh, Fincher, Wigginton, and Boyd, all had really productive springs mm, gotcha. like you, you really sometimes you'll go through a spring and you're like you know you don't really felt like you got enough out of them or they really showed what they could do but all three of those guys took a huge step forward which which is huge that's where yeah. this depth piece comes in and mm -hmm. i'm at the point now where i feel like those guys could go in a game and i would trust them to be able to play so you take that then you take the three newcomers that came you know, you, you take Stan Ramil and Dellinger and, and uh, Keyshawn, and you look at what they've done, uh, especially the two freshmen. I had a hard time thinking of too many freshmen I've had in my whole career that have come in, mastered the playbook, and, and really played well. Like, when those guys were in there with the threes, and sometimes they had the threes going against the twos, you know, you didn't notice. And, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing in the old line world, right? It's, it's yeah. typically, you know, there's issues. Guys cut loose. Mm -hmm. There's problems freshman doesn't know the assignment you know yada yada and that wasn't the case with them you know we were able to put the threes there and just keep, keep humming along and, and play at a fairly high level with those guys so those are some guys that really stood out you know you got the other guys that you know when we talk about like a brandon baldwin and a spencer brown you know those guys to me still have a pretty high ceiling because they you know their first year starter you know baldwin only started half the year and spencer's had one year under his belt you know only had a few games under his belt so there's still a lot of growth for those guys. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to squeeze every ounce we can get out of J.D. and Nick. You know, there's things they can get better at, and they know that. And, you know, you even talk about NFL. It's, it's funny. We've had some guys that we talked to that came through and even were interested in our, our you know, our head recruiting job. And some guys that had NFL experience. And one thing that kind of stood out is, you know, when the, when they're going through and they're, they're getting ready to draft guys, even the NFL feels like the old line is still a developmental position. Like a lot of those skill positions, they expect them to come in and play right now and be ready to go. But even even as those guys get to the NFL, they still have room to develop. So it, it really never ends. Gotcha. It's, it's a constant pace of perfection in the old line room. Huh. I never yeah. thought about that way, but yeah, that's bang yeah. on. I mean. Yeah. And, and Coach was right about how O line is the hardest to predict because a lot of these kids in like 10th, 11th grade, they're like tight ends. They move them inside. They're like 245 pounds. And the coach has yeah. to say, can this kid move at 305 when we had 60 on him? And Aston Leffo, I think he's added about 50 pounds since the day he committed. And Braden Miller has beefed up and, and a lot of these guys. But um, I guess, Coach, from a recruiting standpoint, um, last cycle, you got a top 247 guy in Stanton Ramil, who you already talked about being advanced. I believe he was Michigan State's highest ranked O-line commit in 23 years. Um, from a recruiting standpoint, what are the traits you look for? Because I know it's not just stars. Um, we're not able to talk about the guys in the current class, but uh, for those that are watching, that's a testament to how Coach trusts his own evaluation, and it doesn't matter about where the kids are ranked. So what are the actual criteria that you use, Coach, to decide, hey, I'm going to go all in on this kid no matter what the stars say? What are you looking for? Well, the, the first thing is, you know, there, there's parameters of size and length for certain positions, right? you're right playing tackle guard or center so so some of that's a little bit of a non-negotiable there's some you know let's for instance let's say a kid's six four he's right on that that border of being a tackle well you know some kids are six four with great length and what i mean by that long arms right and, and how good are his feet so he could probably play on the edge maybe he's a six four guy a little shorter arms more of a more of a you know just a physical guy in the run game can play better in the interior. That's a guard. So those are the first things. And then when you're watching the film, you know, I mean, defensive linemen, it seems to me like they just get better every year. It, it, mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how athletic these guys are that we're having to block. And I think they're they're developing at a, a, a fast rate as well. So you have to be able to move your feet. you got to have great feet up front. And, and you have to be able to, to bend, which allows you to change direction quickly. You know, the big no-no is when you watch these big guys that are waist benders. That, that, that's going to get them beat when they're blocking some of the guys they're going to have to block at this level. So you're really looking for guys that have that ability to bend and sink, change direction, good feet. And then you want guys that are going to play hard and play physical. I think that's important. If they're not dominating guys at the high school level, they're not going to come here and do that. And then the other thing about it is 
is is there's just certain guys that have something inside of them that, that, that they have a will to want to finish people they enjoy it like it's it's something that you know that's just in them and can you take a guy that doesn't have that in high school and make him that way in college that's that's a tough road like i feel like i can as a coach i can get him to play harder and really teach them how to finish and then if they come in a room and see some guys that are doing it it becomes contagious that's true but you got to have two or three dogs in your room so the rest of the guys you know understand this is the way the game got to be played yeah yeah so um that's a great recap there coach my last question for you um I don't know how many people know this, but we kind of reported it on our site last year. But you had interest from multiple schools or across college football. Uh, you decided to turn them down. There were big-time programs, and you decided to stay at Michigan State. You knew the O-line room was, was still in flux and needed a rebuild. It was not an easy task, and you doubled down on it and stayed here. What was your rationale for doing that? Can you take fans inside your, your decision to double down? Well, it's it's, you know – be honest, we love it here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about Coach Tucker. You know, I've been coaching a long time, and and you know, I there's not a, there's not a better man that you can work with. Just from the day to day culture that we have in our building, the blueprint and plan that he has in place. You know, he's he's been around some of the elite or greatest coaches in, in college and NFL football, so he knows what it takes to get it done. And I believe in it. And you know, so you take all that, and then those guys in my room, you know, I believe in them, and I've got a great room. Those guys, those guys, they're going to give you everything they got, you know, and and I feel like I owe them the same thing. And, and my family, my family loves it here. You know, my, my son, my oldest son's a sophomore at Michigan State, and he's he's doing very well. He actually is working in our scouting department, which is great. I, don't, I still don't get to see him, but he's down there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my youngest son's a sophomore at East Lansing High, and, you know, he plays all the sports and he enjoys himself. And my wife loves it here. We, we got a unique staff. There's guys on the staff I've known since for 23 years. Here's a fun fact. Coach Gilmore and I got hired at the University of Kansas at the same time. Mm. We, we shared an apartment for four months in 1999. You, wow. fast forward, you, you fast forward 21 years to the 21, no, 22 years later, his son and my son are college roommates. Wow. wow. That is a fun fact. <laughs> wow. That is nuts. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. I mean, and, you know, Jay Johnson was on that staff. And then my first job after that, I go to Alabama State. I walk in the door, and the first guy I meet is a strength coach. Who's a strength coach? Jason Novak. Uh, <laughs> and this is crazy. This is all <laughs> so, new wow. insight. <laughs> That's so, amazing. you know, the, the, when, when, you're, when you go to work every day and, and you believe in the people that are in the building with you and, and you know we're all heading in the same direction – Believe it or not, that's not the way it is in a lot of places. I can promise you that. Right. And, and that's the way it is here. So, um, like I said, this is this is the place to be for me. And we have a goal to win a championship here, and we can get it done. And there's no reason for me to be anywhere else. There we go. And just one more round of questions for me, and this is going to be lightning round. So this is going to put you squarely on the hot seat if you're ready. We've called this uh, Juice Squad World. That's right. we got four quick questions. you got to name a player on your Juice Squad for all four of these categories. Coach, are you oh, ready man. to be put on the hot seat here? I know. Oh, there's there's pressure here. Let's not, let's not lie about this. This is, this is intense. Let's do it. Player you would trust the most on stage to do a 10-minute a stand-up comedy bit? Nick Samak. Or All Spencer right. Brown. That's a tie. There we go. That's a tie. Uh, player you would trust to step in as a babysitter for your kids? I know you mentioned that they're in college and high school. Let's say they're 10 years younger. What player would you trust the most to babysit your kids? Trust the most. That's a good question right there. Thank you. I trust a lot of them. There's a lot of them that could do it. You know, I, I can go back. Nick Sameback, JD, uh, Braden Miller's kind of, I have to be careful, Braden doesn't talk much, so he might not be able to keep him in line. <laughs> gotcha. so that, that's a lot of TV time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ethan Boyd. Ethan Boyd's a great guy. I mean, you know, that's the fine line. You you want to have guys in your room that you would trust to babysit the kids, but you want to have some in the room that you, you really don't want babysitting your kids. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a great qualification. So you gotta be six foot four, and you also, you know, can just, uh, just change everything off on, on a dime. I like that. Uh, all right, let's say your car uh, breaks down. Your car won't start in your driveway. You have to call one of your players to come out and fix it. Who are you trusting to fix your car? Who's the mechanic on the team? Mm. Ooh, the mechanic on the team. Yeah. You see, that's the one you're gonna stump me on. 
Yo, All right, what, what about who's yourself. the most reliable to pick up and come get you out of the jam? Ooh, that's a good one too. I like that. Well, yeah. Well, you, I don't think you heard me. I went with Keyshawn Blackstock just to the oh, original okay. question and answer. Okay. So he, his his stepdad actually has a shop that fixes cars, so he has to know something. <laughs> something at least not a fixed flat tire yeah just something <laughs> and last one i got for you um just you know casual low stress job university president uh you have to nominate one offensive lineman <laughs> to be the president of michigan state university who are you appointing coach what do you got the president of michigan state university yep. just a light <laughs> job. yeah wow yeah that, that that's a tough one there um all right Let's see. Let's 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 go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with. Let's let's go with Kevin Wigginton. Okay. Let's go. Congratulations, Kevin. I'll notify him the, after the show. The, wow. the recruiting department of the University of Michigan is gonna be off the charts if <laughs> oh, Kevin's president. <laughs> he, I call I call him the senator. So you know, just because he, oh. you know, he kind of he comes from the Hun school. He, you know, his 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 dad's an attorney. His mm. mom is a, a judge. So he, you know, I can see him. He's a guy that can kind of mix with the upper crust of the world, and then he can perfect. Deal with the, <laughs> perfect. The guy for food. So he, he sometimes I feel like you know he's got a little politician in him. Not, okay. not in a negative way, but he's he's the guy. <laughs> That's that's that sounds like the perfect guy yeah. for the role actually. The, the perfect, rationale so. there is spot on. Yeah, to start off as a joke, but I think I'm seriously gonna yeah. try to get him to yeah. that seat here. In a he bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll make the campaign. Oh. We'll make it the push. Yeah, but Coach, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, we know you're out on the road, so really, really do appreciate you making the time. And hopefully you have some podcasts dialed up as you continue to, to travel all month long yeah. and uh, a lot of car rides, a lot of flights. So thank you so much, Coach. Yeah, thanks a lot, Coach. Try to enjoy a minute of your Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, you're the best. Appreciate you. All right. <clears throat> what a guy. Yeah. Man. Yeah, no wonder you know offensive line recruiting is uh doing so well yeah i, mean, I can yeah kind of see it there imagine just getting pitched by him <laughs> i mean i know i'm incredibly biased i'm a massive michigan state fan but uh i would have an incredibly hard time yeah. saying no to anything yeah. that, that guy sells me i think C cap walks into your living room he's gonna say hey i'm gonna go on a podcast and i'm gonna tell them you can be the next university president if you come to if you come <laughs> oh, to michigan state that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but two guys have some massive pull at the university. That's right. Just mm, look at us. Oh, man. So, well, that's uh, kicking off football talk here. But, yeah. hey, uh, let's just keep up the football staff talk yeah. going here. Hey, that open recruiting mm. role has been filled. Yeah. That's right. Let's go. Let's get it popping. Mark yeah. Dethorn. That is correct. Let's go. Yeah. So, Michigan State hired Mark Dethorn uh, earlier this week to fill the title of Executive Director of Player Personnel and Recruiting. Uh, so meaning he both is sort of the tape grinder, scout that manages the board, and also oversees the overall vision of recruiting, setting up official visits, the logistics of kind of what they want to hit on and structuring and all that. I know on-campus recruiting coordinators do a lot of the, the like gritty work in that regard, but the vision comes from up top. So both player personnel and recruiting there from Mark D. Thorne. He was originally from Virginia Tech and uh, was at Pittsburgh before that. At Pittsburgh, he was the director of recruiting. And um, it was Pat Narduzzi who promoted him in 2015 to that director of recruiting role. And um, so last two spots, blue collar programs that they don't really get to rely on name cachet. It is more sure. of finding guys, finding them early, having faith in your evaluations. And uh, at Virginia Tech, that was the tail end of the uh, Frank Beamer era. And um, as The Athletic kind of did a profile on that time, anytime you have a coach there that's at one place for that long, the program's recruiting operations kind of get stale. And that was the case at Virginia Tech. And Mark D. Thorne talked, talked them through it. Uh, in that article and he basically explained hey we had to modernize things we had to change the way we did official visits we have to change the way we brand the program so he was responsible for that modernizing virginia tech did a little bit of that at pitt too prior to that he actually got uh, started in football his first job was working under urban meyer in the mark pantoni tree of uh, of the personnel so mark pantoni he's at ohio state now but he's one of the um, basically the godfathers of the player personnel business. So great tree to come from there. Um, he went into that role by quitting his job in finance, working for PNC Bank, 
uh, where he was using his degree, quit that, took out a loan, moved all the way down to Gainesville where he never worked or never has been before, took out a loan, enrolled in school, worked at Mark Pantone, worked, Mark, worked with Mark Pantone, and rose all the way up. So there's no question this guy likes ball. He quit a stable career to, to take a leap a of faith in this. So. This guy likes a chop. No, that's, yeah. uh, that's a great story. Yeah. So what do you think, Matt, about this hire? question for you actually oh, okay. this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna bounce it right back to you sorry good. Ho hope you're not done no talking. yeah when is it fair to start to judge mr d thorn because mm. obviously june visit season is coming up here right me personally i'm just a clown on the outside i, I think that may be a little too early to start judging right. uh, a guy that's stepping up to this role yeah. so quickly is that fair or are you gonna see some things I this uh, month coming up I think, um, well, a lot of the stuff, we won't know what happens on official visits because the itinerary and the structure of yeah. the presentations do, we won't be able to see. But I think he should be able to have a tangible effect in June yeah. in that capacity. He should be able to go ahead and insert his vision on how official visits at Michigan State should go from, from right on. Uh, I think in terms of judging him for how they're stacking the board, who mm -hmm. they're prioritizing, who they're taking – some of the some of that you might not be able to know until you can decide if these kids are hits or not sure. maybe until they enter the portal and leave or if they are on the field doing well but i think you're gonna have an idea on if their vision is sustainable if they're missing on guys that um they don't have backups for and stuff like that yeah. so you can start to form a little picture throughout the rest of this cycle um but in terms of really bottom line analysis it's going to be on the guys that they're signing how they do when they get here so I got I got to be patient. Is that Unfortunately, what Matt, that appears to be the case. <sighs> I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I'm not, no, I, I, I do like the guy's background though. Just like you said, with like the blue collar s right. programs like Pitt, Virginia Tech, and uh, Virginia Tech out of the Beamer era. Like I'm sure there was some very uh, hmm, how am I gonna put this? Well stated ways they would do things back then. You know, not mm -hmm. a lot of budging through the Beamer era and kind of getting out of that system. So yeah, he's been through a few different regime changes, which is nice. And that's not to say there's a regime change going on right now, but there's definitely going to be a change of pace of how Michigan State maybe goes about, you know, June recruiting season coming up and official visits, who goes where, how the board is stacked, everything right. like that. So this this guy, uh, all the way from working for Urban Meyer down to yeah. hey, let's uh, try to tidy up here what the Beamer era did at the end of that tenure did yeah. like that. Very well versed yeah. in his time in college football. And, yeah, I just love the story about the gamble, though. Like, ah, okay, yeah. well, let's see a great job at uh, PNC. Uh, let's let's just be like a GA or something uh, down yeah. in Gainesville. Let's see what happens. Soon. A lot of times these jobs that are on the personnel side, on the recruiting side, it comes down to obviously who can value a talent. But beyond that, it's who's going to work longer than they have to? Who's going to be working gotcha. at midnight? Who's going to really like this job? to the point where you don't have to worry about them quitting and going into corporate life because there's more money and more stability there. Mark checks those boxes because we know he has tangibly made that switch over. And he really has a passion for this job. Yeah. And one other thing I noticed is that a lot of the associate um, directors of player personnel or the recruiting coordinators, uh, coordinators under him, they are at other universities as directors of player personnel right now. All four of the members that were quoted in the 2018 article at The Athletic at Virginia Tech, all four of those members are now directors of player personnel around in college football. Wow. And um, talking about Mark to people around the industry and just seeing the reaction on Twitter as well, a lot of people vouch for him. So it seems like he's a guy that, that rubs people the right way, builds relationships, and gets his people promoted. So it seems to be the case. There we go. Well, welcome, Mark Deathorn. Go get him. Let's go. Hit the ground running. We're going to start judging you immediately off the bat in June, so cannot wait for that. Justin, is it time to get to some uh, bigger news of the week here? Um, because two players. Mm. Well, actually, well, hold on here. Let me start that over again. Three players. Yeah. Said adios to Michigan State football uh, on Sunday, the last day that you could enter your name in the transfer portal. Now, uh, of course, one of them already came back, Chuck Brantley. That's very yeah. fun. We'll get to him in a hot second. But the other two guys, uh, <sighs> presumed starting quarterback Peyton Thorne or, you know, maybe not the starting quarterback in the fall, at least leaving spring camp. That's what it seemed to look like. And then um, pretty solid wide receiver in Keon Coleman. Yeah. Said goodbye. Now. It's up to you how uh, you want to start this. I'll, I'll put the ball in your court. Like, we don't have to talk about, like, what led to this. This is three days old at this point. Yeah. We can maybe just talk about what this means moving forward here. I've got plenty of thoughts. I can go till midnight on this. <laughs> um, so, really, just whatever ball you want to set up on whatever yeah. tee, uh, I'll, I'll let you do this one because I can go 85 different directions here. <laughs> yeah, I think at this point um, – it's been uh, kind of beaten to death, kind of the rationale behind it, and I've talked about it in multiple places now. But um, at this point, we are where we are, and that is where 
it's Peyton Thorne, Keanu Coleman leaving, Charles Brentley coming back, as you said. So at this point, it's what happens next? Now, I think Michigan State's going to keep trying with Keon Coleman. Um, I don't know the chances of, of him actually coming back. I Like I've said in the past, I probably wouldn't gamble my own money on that. Um, same. But at the, at the same time, I guess it's the portal. You never know. Maybe he takes a visit to somewhere else, and it's not what he thought it would be. But at the end of the day, I would not advise um, holding out a ton of hope. Uh, Peyton Thorne, I wouldn't expect him to be coming back. Um, but again, portal, weird things. But so now we are at these two departures Yep. and looking at replacing them quarterback wise. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go and get somebody else, um, uh, for a multitude of reasons. For one, if you look to add a starter, it would have to be someone that is clear cut, undoubtedly better than Noah Cam and, Pay- and, uh, Kate Hauser. Yeah. I don't think in the spring portal, anybody like that exists. Agreed. So yeah. now if you talk about adding a QB three, just cause you're, you're iffy on those two guys, plus Sam Levy being your only quarterbacks, you have to ask yourself who in the portal would be comfortable coming in and being definitively QB three. And if they are okay with that, why would they come to Michigan state? Maybe you go and you ring chase at Alabama or something. Maybe instead you go down to D2 or FCS and try to yep. be a starter. So you're not gonna, that's not something you're going to be able to sell people on. At the end of the day, the way I look at it is if you have to turn to somebody that deep in your depth chart anyway, season is probably not, not salvageable. Good. So <laughs> not good. I, don't, I yeah. don't see any logic in going ahead and adding a quarterback. Now, receiver. Talk to me. There are some good options in the portal there. There are, actually. There are some that yeah. have visited. There are some that have been offered publicly who – it seems like we'll be visiting this upcoming uh, season or weekend. I kind of want to ask you a question, Matt. Yeah, please. And um, I asked this to Justin Spiro when I was on his, his show Sunday. If you take and you subtract Keon Coleman from the starting lineup, mm-hmm. elite player, I think a round two receiver. Yeah. And you subtract Peyton Thorne. And this is with the understanding that he did not take a big leap up hypothetically from previous year's quarterback play. So mm-hmm. that baseline, that was last year, maybe even a hair above that. Sure. Can't call me. You subtract those from the starting lineup. Yeah. You add in either Noah Kim or Kane Hauser, who let's just say they don't light the world on fire, but they're also not a definitive step down. Mm-hmm. Just average quarterback play there. Um, and you add two receivers that, you would grade as B or B plus receivers, meaning maybe as talented as Trey Mosley, maybe a little better production might not be there. They're in that tier. So you have a math equation. You're subtracting Peyton Thorne, subtracting Ken Coleman. You're adding two B plus receivers and quarterback play. Let's say is not a concern. My question to you is how many wins does, does that subtract for you from the season total? I've been saying that the key on departure has been, two wins maybe two wins tops okay and that's still a lot don't get me wrong like for right, one right. player to have that impact like don't get it twisted right. that is a lot of games here in case anyone's confused on that but man if if it's the two like b plus receivers then a, a game maybe right but that's the thing right i mean it's uh it's replacing one great player with two pretty solid players you would miss one guy being double teamed in keon Cole, yes. so that could shift the paradigm of some things but then again like if, if you got everyone good at x y and z like, okay that, yeah so you're I not going, that a little easier you're not going from eight wins to three wins that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah correct yeah you're going eight to maybe seven but probably staying at eight is, is where i would put that right okay so we're on the same fair. page there, it's so. crazy to say either yeah. yeah 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 so i i think that's kind of the way i look at it that is the way that this boils down to me is you there's no spin zone in keon being an elite receiver and somebody that you absolutely would like to have on your team it's sad yeah right yeah i just can't I can't really accept the fact that losing a receiver drastically changes the entire outlook of your team. And that has nothing to do with Keon. That just has to do with, I think somebody actually, I should have verified this myself, but someone actually brought to my attention that in terms of wins above replacement metrics, um, a receiver is about 0.7 wins. Okay. And I think that's a little underselling Keon's ability, to be honest. I can see a game where Keon has two red zone jump ball catches, but that's kind of what the metrics say. And, as um, Justin said when I was on his show, 
if an injured receiver gets on the injury report right before a game, line mm-hmm. moves maybe a point or two. Mm-hmm. So I just think that a lot of the reaction was overblown, even though I think there's no denying that Keon is a special, special talent. Yeah, it's just the, the biggest thing you're going to miss there, you know, you brought up the red zone, is that, mm-hmm. you know what, we lost one jump ball guy with Jaden Reed. Mm-hmm. Lost the second one with Keon yeah. Coleman there. And, like, anyway, we'll see the other receivers that they do bring on and see if their yeah. jump ball abilities. But, yeah, that's – No that's, commodities, though, lost. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing that, that you're missing. But right. I, I want to switch back to the quarterback talk yeah. um, really quick here. And I, I don't presume they'll take a third quarterback right. um, in this room or got fourth if you want to include Sam Levitt. I right. mean, of course. But I don't think they'll take TJ Finley. Um, I don't think that they're <laughs> going to take the guy that Peyton Thorne is, is replacing, you know, right. just that easily. So yeah. what would the point of that be? Um, Here's the sunny side, though, okay? I, I just yes. want to bring up the sunny side before like, I, I bring up a question here. The sunny side is that you know this quarterback battle, while it did run probably Peyton Thorne out of town, he probably wasn't thrilled being a two-year incumbent and saying, uh, great, now I'm in a quarterback battle in my third year here, and oh, awesome, almost all the fan base doesn't want me to win. Like That probably had a small role to do with him transferring, but if not for nothing else, the silver lining, like the other two guys, Noah Kim, mm-hmm. Kane Hauser, have have been preparing all spring as if they are in the starting role like this was a pretty hotly contested starting position and of course every offseason they're going to be competing at their highest but knowing that the starting position was on the line there it's going to be easier to flip that switch going into this whole summer as they go into the fall entering the fall knowing that they are the ones in command here they're not going to be playing second fiddle so yeah, I think that also helped too. Is that that competition for a little bit already primed them for right. what's to come? You know, this uh, summer and this fall. But the question I have here, yes, and maybe it's just a statement that I just want you to gut check really yeah. quick. But I think it's this is all from the quarterback perspective better for the program. And I don't mean that in saying that like, oh, Peyton Thorne's trash, he's garbage. Like, no, that's not what I mean. I mean that what we just brought up quarterback battle he's in his third year a lot of the fan base doesn't want him I, I think that that would have caused some major tension inside a Spartan stadium whether it just be from the 75,000 fans filling that stadium or maybe even some of the players and teammates or the coaches like that would have been pretty tense to start the season because that is the shortest leash possible I think patience would have been incredibly thin knowing that right. well hey we just had this quarterback battle great new guy and oh awesome it's he he won it again well i'm just gonna jump on him the second he screws up and that first three and out against central or richmond whenever it happens like the boobers come out of spartan stadium and oh boy it's it's starting to get nasty pretty early here so i that's what i mean of like short term it might just be better for all parties involved obviously Payne's happy with his decision that's mm-hmm. why he left i don't think he was held at gunpoint to leave but I think it might just be better for Michigan State, too, and maybe just gives a little bit more patience for the quarterback position as we go into the fall, especially in these early games, too, man. Like, it's, it's a tough schedule to start the season. And, okay, Central, Richmond, fine. Then, uh-oh, mm-hmm. Washington. Mm-hmm. I just saw a mock draft with four Washington Huskies in the first round, Justin, for next year. So that's going to be a good team. Yeah. And then, well, going on the road to Iowa City to face the Hawkeyes. Mm-hmm. That'll be a tough one in week five as well. So I just I think it offers a little bit of patience for the quarterback room too. I mean, mm-hmm. not to say that it's going to be like irritating if things aren't going well off the bat, but I don't think the Boo Birds are going to be out and like all the headlines yeah. and the scrutiny. And so that's just a that was, thanks for letting me. Yeah, there. I I hundred yeah. percent agree with yeah. that sentiment. Not only um, is what you said true about it, it gives a a more relaxed and uh, long view sort of approach from the fan base uh, to look at the, the quarterback position, but also even beyond the short term that you said of what it might feel like this upcoming season, yeah. you now have two quarterbacks that have three and four years of eligibility yep. playing a year sooner. Yep. So I don't think they were going to compete for the national title this year. I don't think they wow, hater. were probably wow. going to, com- <laughs> to to win the big 10 this year. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just not where I'm projecting it. <laughs> With those two things said, yeah, I think it's way better for you to have a quarterback, whether it's um, Kim who has three years left, whether it's Hauser that has four years left. Um, I know that they're two classes apart recruiting cycle-wise, but Kim has the COVID year, so yep. that's why the gap is bridged to one year difference. It is so much better, I think. Even even if you do not believe that Kim or Hauser is going to be a slight upgrade from 2022 Thorne, mm-hmm. which there are arguments to be made that that is the case based on what I've heard from some of the – um, first two private scrimmages. Okay. Um, even if you do not believe that, the argument is there that for the long-term potential fulfillment of the program and these two quarterbacks, 
I think um, it, it was a positive development what happened on Sunday from that regard. Yep. So, I mean, th- again, not not to just, you know, I, I don't want to come up as like dancing on a grave, you know, good riddance to him. But like, I, I generally wish him the best, you know, go get him down. It, the Iron Bowl is home this year. So that's going to be very exciting. I mean, hopefully that leads to good things. But yeah, <laughs> good luck. It is what it is. At this point, it's it's three days old. So that's why we're kind of turning the page here. And just I, I like how matter of fact, you're just saying he's at Auburn and rolled, moved in. <laughs> Dude, it, like, it, it's more of a guarantee that the sun will rise tomorrow that yeah. yeah of course yeah war eagle baby to let's your go credit <laughs> to your credit you yeah. were the first one that that told me about the auburn link i i heard from more people like before this all unfolded that yeah. pt is going to auburn weeks like, ago more weeks than i've heard ago. from my own family in the last month like it's yeah, yeah very bizarre like yeah. i don't get a ton of inside scoops firsthand <laughs> i'll get a lot of them like after you know peeking my nose in different places but like this one fell in my lap from a few people it's like yeah <laughs> What is going on right here? Am I Hugh Freeze? Do people have the wrong number? Yeah. Like, so, so I don't know how that happened. But yeah, yeah that was an uh, interesting way to start the weekend. Yeah, so. yeah. sure. So yeah, yeah but, uh, you you got that before anyone else I know I knew. And then um, even from different channels, um, it, it was just coming out so easily and quickly. It's like what what is happening here? With the, like this is the worst case of tampering, like worst case in terms of the worst like. Yeah, in terms of how it was oh, operated, it's it's in it's plain t- sight. Yeah, <laughs> if I know what's happening, like yeah, imagine how bad you are at it. Like uh, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, and like you hear rumors that like, oh, there could be a commitment soon. It's like, I give it a week. Like at yeah. least throw the scent off of what's happening. Like it just act like nothing, take, nothing weird. Take happened. a visit to Oregon State. <laughs> yeah, go sure. see go what Lubbock is all about, <laughs> right. and then go. <laughs> yeah, God, do you know what? That's what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a consultant. For for Tampering. transfers that have been tampered with. I'm just going to guide them through the process. Just how to, how to make it as not, not you know, obvious as possible. So yeah. we'll see. I'll start that uh, business up uh, right after yeah. we finish the, the other, show. Here. The other thing that's interesting here, if he doesn't end up at Auburn, um, I've seen cases where the tampering got out in the public and then the school had to pull out as oh. a result of that. Oh, oh. So oh, <laughs> I don't know what would happen in that case. but I'd feel a little bad, actually. <laughs> I'm just wanting, I'm covering you that in case someone's like, oh, she said he's going to Auburn. <laughs> that doesn't mean she had wrong intel. It just might mean that Auburn was like, oh, shoot, we really messed up the way we handled yeah, I was it. Just, I was just too loud yeah. with my intel. Yeah. Oh, everyone knows it. Though. Like, it's, it's their fault. Not everyone yours. on Twitter has been on it today. Like, yeah, yeah. so I'm College I'm, football I'm portal, like, verified account or whatever source yeah they they tweeted it to the masses so that's right that might as well be official here yeah Um, and i i think i may have gone on greg mcelroy's show down in birmingham alabama and (laughs) and and accidentally (laughs) said that i heard auburn was tampering instead of a school down south but it is what it is um Uh, moving on matt what are you gonna do what are you gonna do Really quick, Chuck Brantley, love him being back. I'm just yes. going to throw that out there right now. Um, look, the I, I have been in fetal position in the corner of my room more nights <laughs> than I'd like to admit. Uh, just over the fear of the lack of depth at the defensive back position going right. into this season. Chuck Brantley leaving, did not find that appealing whatsoever. Right. I was not really jazzed about that. Um, but uh, you know what? We were, we were over the moon uh, yeah. that he came back. Look, I mean, this is a guy, his third year in that Scotty Hazleton system, all right, starting uh, experience at the cornerback position as well, and just yeah. a solid college football cornerback, and you can never use enough of those. Right. So, yeah, man, especially when you go look at who is behind him. Okay, it's a bunch of young guys, Caleb Coley. Right. Chance Rucker, okay. Yeah. Heard good things about them, but still they're very young. Right. And also Marky Lowry, solid player as well. He has his injury issues as well. Yeah. So like any any depth possible, like, and this is the best way like I've been putting it. Yeah. If you told me a guy like Chuck Brantley was in the portal, I'd be praying that we get him. So like it, it, this is just fantastic. I just had to throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Just, to, just to put a cap on the transfer portal talk. Yeah. I don't think I don't think they can be picky about who's in the two deep right now just because it's a lot of unproven, exciting no. young potential. So Correct. Anybody, anybody that wants to play for Michigan State at this point, you, uh, you're happy to have him at corner. How many years you got? <laughs> How many years you got? I don't, Say I don't it. have the, I don't have the hips to play corner. Ah, shoot. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't have anything. A, so. a curl route would just break my, <laughs> break my body in half. Your ACLs just disintegrate. <laughs> just <laughs> terrible. Tough scenes. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah, we'll leave it in to the, the flag kids. in the flag football league. I was playing 15 yards back off the line of scrimmage. Oh, I like yeah. that. Nice. There we go. Some Jabril uh, Jabril Peppers at uh, Cleveland <laughs> Browns. Uh, Same amount of interceptions there. too. Ah, mm. anyway. there we go. Nice. <laughs> Moving on to the NFL. Yes, that's right. Some of our Spartan dogs got drafted. Uh, Justin, if I bet one dollar 
for the combination of Jaden Reed, Bryce Berenger, and Amir Speed to be the three Spartans drafted. How much would the Justin Thind House of Sports booking pay me out for that for a one dollar bet? You could have bought the New York Knicks, Matt. Wow. <laughs> okay, shoot. Well, we have a really great time right now. But yeah, I mean, hey, you know what? Who cares what the naysayers yeah. like uh, like like us have to say? Amir Speed, sixth round overall pick. We'll work from the top down. Uh, right before him, same team. Bryce Berenger, as you guys already know, the Patriots, and then Jaden Reed. Mm-hmm. Look, we think the world of him. Yeah. I'm massive Reed fans, but after combing every mock draft you could possibly find. Be very hard pressed to find one that had him in the second round at 50 overall, but that's where he goes, and that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's a great spot for him, uh, both slot wise, where he goes in the second round, and also just team wise, too. Yeah. Over there in Green Bay, the receivers are Christian Watson. Okay, that's yeah. that's that's it as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> unless you're gonna tell me that Ro- Romeo, Romeo Dobbs, Dobbs. <laughs> okay, or, or Samori Toure, like I'm supposed to take that seriously? Like, uh, no, that's a maybe great they got Randall Cobb back for his 84th season. Sure, right, yeah. Uh, so no, it's it's Jordan just a Nelson great spot coming for out of retirement. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah. No, but I, I couldn't agree more. Um, your analysis is also spot on with. And none of the mocks had him going that high. No. Um, I believe out of everyone that I saw, Dane Brugler was the highest yeah. on Jaden Reed, out of at least out of the respected guys that I look at. And he had him 81st. Yeah. Um, and his note under Reed's scouting report in his draft guide was, this is a receiver that is more talented than some of those in front of him, but okay. did not have the ability to showcase some of that Ball quarterback play other stuff whatever mm. um so his, his his understanding was that even though he liked him a little bit more than that his understanding around the league is that's where he was trending so to see him go 31 spots higher than that is it amazing was, it was great to see amazing yeah and just to round it out here the undrafted free agent so far kendall brooks jacob slade uh going on the same greyhound bus together to arizona because they're both yeah. at the cardinals look at them go jared horse down at miami thought it was interesting their talk about him being an interior lineman mm. that goes back to our conversation with coach cap to start the show is that even when you're in the NFL, it's still developmental. Yep. So Xavier Henderson with the commanders. And last but not least, Ben Van Sumeren to not just the Philadelphia Eagles, but Justin Sins, <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles. JT, let's get some hot hot takes on that one here. Yeah, it's. Um, I think I'm going to file for a name change. The, the franchise changed it to that. But um, yeah, Ben Van Sumeren, I think uh, everyone knows the pro day he had. And uh We'll see. I think uh, special teams is a place where where um, the Eagles used to invest in greatly back in the day. Recently, they have not, and I think uh, that's something they're hoping to change this off season. So we'll see. Maybe he can be a, a lethal gunner there with his speed. He's a point and shoot guy. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what what happens there. And I think this is a name I threw out last week, but Andrew Dahl. Okay, he started his yeah. career undrafted free agent, mixed between defense, special teams, and I, look at it. He's still going for the. New Orleans Saints. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a career to be had for undrafted free agent guys. I know that a lot of people just see undrafted free agents and say, oh, they'll hang around for a cup of coffee, then leave. Like, no, nah, that's not always the case. And if you got the intangibles uh, that Ben Van Sumeren does, right. maybe it does work around. Maybe it does work out and he gets to stick around here. So, yeah. There we go. That's the NFL roundup. Uh, recruiting roundup. Recruiting next, roundup. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I got lost in my own notes here. It's very hard to read. <laughs> I'm trying my best here. All good. So recruiting wise this week, one of the um, big storylines, obviously, is as I touched on earlier with the departure of Keon Coleman, they're going to be looking at some transfer uh, targets there in the portal. So um, there's a few guys there that we'll see which of those they can kind of reel in. But that is what the staff is working on as we speak. Um, also, probably some some defensive backs there as well. I believe my rough math had it at about five scholarship openings. Okay. Um, so we'll see. I, I'd probably guess two receivers, at least one corner, maybe a young linebacker for after um, this wave of seniors leaves in 2023, but probably best available after after the first two positions I mentioned. So um, that's going to be what they're working on behind the scenes, probably trying to keep that as close to the vest as possible because portal recruitments can be finicky. Um, and then kind of what we do in, in May here is, is try to report as many official visits as we can find out about. And um, there's some good ones on the docket. One of them, I'm sure, is a familiar name that Spartan fans will recognize, and that is Nick Marsh, who will be coming back to East Lansing. And uh, he was a former Michigan State commit, as yep. those may know. He's a top 150 receiver from River Rouge. He is him. Yeah, he, he is, is him. him. Yeah. And uh, Michigan State gets his last official visit of June, and he will be committing early July. 
So that is a storyline to watch there. Four-star offensive lineman Nathan Roy from Wisconsin, who has a great offer sheet. Yep. USC, Ohio State, UCLA, Penn State. All those schools are are after him, and uh, he's going to be taking an official visit to Michigan State on the first week of June. And um, there's other ones we have confirmed as well. I don't want to spoil the whole list, but some OVs are getting put on the docket here, Matt. He does have a Miami official, right? I, I, he, or a Miami offer. I didn't do this for nothing. Yes, you are Thank correct. God. Okay. Yes, you are correct. All right, save myself from looking like a clown there. But yeah. all right, no, there you do the research. There's no way you would have gotten that mixed up. No, I was I was pretty certain of it. Um, yeah. The Nick Marsh thing. Now, fact or fiction, I've heard this fact. many a time. In Fact, for sure. There we go. Next go segment. No, I've heard this many a time, like just in the world of recruiting, that you either want the first visit or you want the last one. Like those two have a superior advantage over all the ones in the middle there. Have you seen that as fact or is that kind yeah, of a myth? So, okay. so it, it depends based on where you stand in the recruitment before the recruit or before the visits happen. Uh -huh. So okay. um, my understanding is if you are trailing for a kid, you want to have or or not even trailing if you just do not have a strong lead mm -hmm. for a kid or you're just part of the group and you're worried that hey if he goes to one of the other schools first what if he cancels our visit because he likes them a lot and then he we never get a shot he commits okay so if you want to make a good first impression on a kid that you're not the most confident about or you just don't know where his recruitment sits. That's actually what I should have led with if you don't really know mm -hmm. you'd rather get out to a big lead that's okay. just how you do that's how you would do it not even trailing, just that's how I would put it. Got it. Now, if you feel like you're in a good spot, or if there's a commitment date in place, one or the other, okay, then you would like to put the final dagger in the situation as late as possible. So if you feel like you're in a good spot and a, and a commitment date is set, probably and, not or, like I said last yeah. time, if both are true, you would like to have the last official visit. So right. in Nick Marsh's case, there's a date set, I believe July 7th, you wanna have the last one. If Nick Marsh had no date, Maybe you go for the first one and try to just get him to cancel the rest. Sure. So those are the dynamics and factors at play. Well, that's some good news. I mean, yeah. th there is quite the gap of time between early June right. and then July cl commitment date. And let's not kid ourselves like that phone will be melting uh, yeah. in the weeks leading up to that commitment date. A lot of chatter from a lot of different coaches. But, hey, you know, the last OV counts for something. So yeah. there we have it. Are you ready to be placed in the hot seat, Justin? Yes. Tour facts, one is whack. Now, is of right. course... We like to theme these. We like to make themes out of two are facts. One is whack. And JT, this is one of my favorite sports weeks of the year. Do you know what's happening on Saturday? On Saturday. Phillies are playing a matinee. I don't know. Kentucky oh, Derby, okay. baby. Kentucky okay. Derby. <laughs> Kentucky Derby is your theme of two are facts. One is whack. And don't worry. These are all still Michigan State related. Don't get it twisted. Uh, these are three statements coming out hot. Two of these are facts. Mm. One of them will be whack. Justin, are you ready to play some Kentucky Derby, Michigan State? Two are facts. One is whack. All right. There you have it. Justin, statement number one. Statement number one, there have been more MSU players drafted in football since 2015 than there will be horses running this Saturday. There okay. have been more MSU drafted players in the NFL since 2015 than there will be horses running this okay. Saturday. Statement number two, the length of the last five Kentucky Derbies could fit inside the final drive time against Iowa in 2015. We're talking the game time, not like the amount of time it was on TV right. for, like the 45 minutes, but the actual game time. Okay. Statement number three, there have been more MSU Big Ten football titles than Triple Crown completions this millennium. There have been more MSU Big Ten football titles than Triple Crown completions this millennium. Okay. How are you feeling right now? Are you sweating? I'm feeling, I'm feeling like this upcoming weekend I need to take notes. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so that next year when you ask me oh. on May 1st or whatever, you are gonna I'll be ready. You are going to get me. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. get got next year. Yep. You know it. So I know these races are short. Yeah. For the most part. Relatively speaking. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a NASCAR race with 97 laps or whatever. Not quite. Nope. One lap. <laughs> it is. If they did 97 laps, it'd be awesome. <laughs> I would, oh, I'd love that. People in their um, cardigans and their top hats would get sweaty, though. Dude, it's, yeah, uh, that would be a, a steamy day uh, at Churchill Downs. Oh, we got yeah, him the, again. <sighs> we got him again. Yeah, you got me again. <laughs> the the only, only Churchill Downs knowledge I have is the song by Drake and Jack Harlow. So, sure, I'll take yeah. your word for that. Yeah, why not? I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's a great tune. Um, okay, so I'm thinking that 
the third one, which was the um, less completions of the triple cl- of triple crown than Michigan State titles. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that is correct because, to my understanding, it is very rare to win a triple crown. Hmm. And while I was googling, quote, creative horse races or horse names, okay, a couple months ago, okay, that is a fact that I learned that there's not a lot of triple crown we're gonna, we're gonna circle back to that google yeah. search but yeah that's, yeah that's okay because they were running it on the bottom line at espn oh, okay and i was like these are some creative names yeah so huh. then i was thinking why not look up historically what the most creative names are okay and there were some good ones okay but i don't remember them anymore okay i was gonna say how's this gonna help you right now yeah, anyway. is this helping you right now no, so <laughs> okay. i mean perfect it, it told me that triple crowns are very very rare okay that's so good. hopefully that that's fact good. is true now that looking helps. at the other two okay um uh, more michigan state players drafted in 2015 since 2015 since 2015 yeah. then there will be horses running this saturday yeah i couldn't tell you if there are five horses or 35 horses that's gonna so. be a problem then okay yeah. that's gonna be an issue i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna hope it's like 15 okay and i'm gonna say that one is is true as well okay. and then the middle one was drive time versus five the last five kentucky derbies could you fit race time yeah the last five kentucky derbies. so the wording is could the last of kentucky derbies the fit of, inside the of, length of the last five kentucky derbies combined could fit inside of the final drive time against iowa in 2015 if it's one lap there's five races. One and a quarter. One and a quarter. One and a quarter. Yeah. Oh, we got him on the ropes. Let's this go. This is good. Yep. I feel like all three might be true, but that's not I how should, the game I, would work. I should do that one week. I'm going to go ahead just for time purposes. Okay. <laughs> lock in that the middle one is false. And he says he doesn't know horse racing. Let's go. <laughs> He's on the winning side of things, baby. Let's go. That's what I'm talking Four about. Four and ten for, th- for those keeping track at home. Let's Four go. Ten. Yes, the whack one was the middle one. The length of the last five Kentucky Derbies could fit inside the final drive against Iowa. Mm-mm, absolutely not. The 2015 drive... Nine minutes and four seconds. The average Kentucky Derby length is almost two minutes on the dot. It's just a few seconds above. So that would be about two mi- uh, ten minutes and some change there. So that one is whack. The one or the two that are true. There have been more MSU players drafted since 2015 in the NFL. 23 since 2015 then horses running this saturday there are 20 horses slated for this saturday's running of the roses and then the other one there have been more msu big 10 titles than triple crown completions this millennium american pharaoh justify the only two triple crown winners this millennium used to happen quite a bit back in the day like 40s 50s 60s 70s and there was this massive drought only been two and then well michigan state football three big 10 titles 15, 13, and 2010. So there you have it. Thanks for playing and way to win. Yeah. There we go. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. JT is back. Four back. and ten. Back. I guess we should bring Owen back on the screen too. That's true. Huh? Because he is going to take us all the Spartan transition. dog of the week church right now. Owen, how on earth are we doing, man? It is great to see your wonderful face. We doing okay over there? I'm doing pretty good. I never thought that segment would end, but you know what? I'll take it. <laughs> It listen, ended with the win. Listen, so listen. I, the, I me taking the, chat, the time was well worth it. I'm since bringing I got the same right. timer yeah. in next week. We're, we're, we're putting him on, on the clock next time. <laughs> no, this is They MHSAA say the most exciting two rules. minutes in sports are the Kentucky Derby. Well, the most exciting two minutes of this show were the last segment. <laughs> Love to hear it. <laughs> Spartan Dog of the Week is Justin Thind, actually, for his correct. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right, so let's dive into it. So Michigan State Baseball, if you remember last week, I talked about, I think it was last week, I don't even remember, yep. um, how much they've been rolling in Brock Vradenberg. Well, this week, co-Big Ten Pitcher of the Week is Harrison Cook. Um, went three innings, one outing, and then four and a thirds. Didn't give up any runs. I think two hits in each outing. But Michigan State was able to not only beat Notre Dame on Tuesday, but then they swept Northwestern as well. So some big wins. They still have a hard road ahead of them where they have to go to Illinois. And then they come back next Wednesday for Eastern Michigan. And then at Iowa and then versus Indiana. So it's really the end stretch of the season for MSU baseball and um, before we had Coach Cap on, he was talking about the facilities in Omaha. Well, that's yeah. where the Big Ten tournament actually is this uh-huh. year. So mm-hmm. we will get to see – well, hopefully Michigan State will get to see 
those facilities and be able to play there. And then I guess if they were able to make the NCAA tournament, then move on to get to there. But obviously it takes some work. Their RPI is about in the 60s. So it's going to take some wins down the stretch, but it's definitely possible that the way they've been playing and the, the way that they've been hitting as well. But Harrison Cook coming out of the bullpen and starting games, he's been a big factor. And the, the starting pitching has been a lot better for Michigan State. I talked about that's how they have to work on, and they keep on getting better at that. There we go. Yeah. Look at those baseball Spartans get to work. Yeah. And going to Omaha. You, you could say that the season went to Omaha. Right. Like, that's just cool to say uh, on surface. So Yeah. The the graphic after they go to the Big Ten tournament can be, and we're going to Omaha. And yeah. That's it. That's all you need. Get the fan base fired up. Perception oh, is perception. About. Yep. Look Look that. Owen. Are you going to Omaha, goes. Matt, if we win? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to save that money for Maui. Yeah, that is Maui money. That is a great point, actually. Yeah, I'm donating as much plasma as possible. I actually just sold part of my liver uh, in the black market. I met some guy behind a gas station dumpster to <laughs> carve out that organ for a few extra dollars as well. So, yeah, we're getting to Maui in 2024. Yeah. That's the eyes in the prize. What if, what if they made the College World Series? Would you do it then? Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I, in all reality, I, I would run a full court press to try to uh, get there. Yeah, no doubt. Okay. God, that's so much more right. plasma to donate. It, does, but, yeah. it, it has looked fun on TV. Just it looks amazing r- without the emotional yeah. investment. It's not been as enjoyable. But I imagine if uh, your yeah. Spartans are there and it's a great atmosphere, I think that would be appealing. It always looks electric, and like just SEC fans in general who obviously dominate like the population of the college baseball World Series. Like they just look like great people to party with. So, <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I, I would absolutely try to find a way to make it down to Omaha. Probably by probably by a plane, a bus, perhaps a bike. I don't know. Walking? If that's what it comes to, Owen, that's okay. what I'll do for, for the, the baseball Spartans. No question. No question. Okay. There we go. Fair enough. Yeah, appreciate you, Owen, bringing in the best insight we could have on all the sports at Michigan State. Bang. Look at that. Yeah. I believe that does it today, Matt. Are we going to do this? Are we just going to end the show? Are we going to do it smoothly this time? This time, or how are we going to do this? Oh god, this this could this could, is, is this it? This could end in fifteen seconds or fifteen minutes. I have no idea how this is going to end. Don't I do think, it. Uh, we'll let people go. My Sixers are on air. Have oh! not checked the score. So Why are you still doing here then? Yeah, may, get, maybe yeah. they're down twenty-seven, and me wearing this jersey right now looks dumb. But we'll okay. find out. So, um, are you checking right now? See here, I am checking right now. Yeah, it's good seeing everyone. Oh, <laughs> oh no. All right. Well, a lot that, of game left. A lot of game left. Uh, that does it for this week's episode of the SD for all show. Hopefully you enjoyed our interview with uh, coach cap yeah. and uh, the discussion afterwards. So appreciate you tuning in and uh, we'll see you next week.